This channel is part of the History Hits Network. The polar region of Antarctica is one of the harshest and most unforgiving environments on Earth. It was into this trackless wilderness that Captain Robert Falcon Scott and his four companions ventured early in November 1911. They were determined to be the first men to reach the South Pole. They were never to be seen alive again. For people who write letters and books now criticizing any of these polar ex explorers of 100 years ago, they are totally writing these things for the benefit of their, their apparent fact. It is, in fact, fiction, because hindsight is not something which is a genuine way of judging the abilities and the conceptions of the people at that time. At Captain Scott is very much a legendary figure. Indeed, this institute's named after him. With the Discovery Expedition and Terra Nova Expedition, there were two major Antarctic expeditions with a huge contribution to mapping, uh, geography generally, and science. Scott uh, has become part of the British myth of the explorer hero, I think, and I don't believe that it will ever be otherwise. But that is not to say that he has escaped criticism. I find it really difficult to imagine what it must have been like for Scott and those other early Antarctic explorers. At the time, Antarctica was an unexplored and certainly unknown continent, and there were certainly no maps or no charts of the area. So you know, one wonders if Scott really knew what he was what Antarctica was going to be like and what he was letting himself and his fellow team members in for, really. I think that discussing the mistakes that, that Scott made is a, a futile argument. Um, who knows? Who's to say what decisions he made at what time that were right or wrong? Hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, we all think we could, we could have done better. We all think that you know, or what I wouldn't have done, he was stupid to do that. But it, it's impossible to second guess the situation he was in. It's not unlikely that the cold, the stress, um, malnutrition, whatever, things like that can have a, an amazing effect on your decision making abilities. And I think it's quite unfair to try and second guess what he was thinking at a time when we, we have no idea how, how things were working out for them. Robert Falcon Scott, the British Antarctic explorer and his brave polar party, finally arrived at the southernmost point on Earth, the South Pole, on the 17th of January, 1912. For 78 days, they had fought their way through unimaginable weather conditions, through driving blizzards and temperatures which had fallen as low as 40 degrees below freezing. Despite their heroic efforts, the hand of fate was to prove unkind to them. The black flag which greeted them at the Pole had been placed there a month beforehand by a Norwegian team, led by Roald Amundsen. This particular black flag was the one that Amundsen left on the South Pole, a standard survey flag. The colour is, of course, black, as were all the survey flags used in the White Continent. Just over a year later, the news of the British team's deaths reached London, and so the name of Robert Falcon Scott immediately passed into legend. There was little in his early life to mark him down for such greatness. Born on the 6th of June, 1868, he was brought up in the comfortable surroundings of Oatlands, the family home in Devonport. 
His mother was a strong Victorian matriarch, and his father was a quiet man who suffered from the odd violent outbursts of temper. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans, with exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. Whether you're looking to dive into life and crime in Victorian London, or the forgotten history that deserves to be heard, History Hit has a documentary for you, just a click away. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you can't find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. According to the early biographies, it appears that he had a very happy childhood, and he played with his sisters in the garden of his father's house. Uh, certainly, when he was in the Navy, he felt very responsible for his mother. His father died and left his mother widowed, and she had a very small amount of money to live on and was largely supported by Scott himself. By 1887, at the age of 19, Scott was fully immersed in a career in the Navy, training as a torpedo officer on the HMS Rover. In the same year, Scott came into contact with Sir Clemens Markham, who would irrevocably change the course of his life. Markham was a true Victorian gentleman who was obsessed by the idea of conquering the Antarctic region. He recognized the area as the ultimate challenge to man, with mystery and danger in equal measure. There was only one thing more important to Markham than getting a man to the pole, and that was that the man should be British. Clement Markham knew that he wanted somebody of a certain age, and he went out, and when, whenever he was in society all over the place, he was looking out, and he once went to a boat race, a naval boat race, between three young lieutenants, and the one that won was Scott, and he remembered that when he saw them many years later. The two men did not meet until 1899, 13 years after Markham had spotted Scott's potential. Within two days, Scott had applied for the post of commander on the Antarctic expedition. If Scott needed fresh impetus and direction, the prospect of the Antarctic challenge must have seemed almost too good to be true. The Antarctic which Robert Falcon Scott was to come to know was recorded for posterity in these famous watercolors by his great friend and fellow explorer, Dr. Edward Wilson. The diary is the one that Edward Wilson kept and in it he includes some amazing sketches of the hut, the flag and uh, the Norwegian uh, items actually at the South Pole. The method Wilson used for producing his magnificent watercolours was to do these sketches and paint them up uh, in the uh, hut. You couldn't do watercolours in the field, the stuff was very much a solid. But if you look at this one, for instance, again the Norwegian tent at the pole, you'll see that he's put little indications around the sketch of the flag, giving its colours, red, white and blue. Also bits on the texture, the red uh, brown leather pieces, likewise on the tent were sufficient for Wilson as an expert artist. The Antarctic Wilson recorded is the most remote continent on Earth. I find it impossible to try and imagine what it was like even the remotest field party today will have a radio that they can contact base, contact other field parties. The bases have got radios, uh, satellite phones, email, fax, um, and all the other sort of modern com communications. Compare that with, with Scott's day, and they had nothing other than what they could carry a message by hand or, or, or by mouth. They had to, to go from one person to another, even if the, the parties were separated by, by thousands of miles to pass a message. And, and getting a message out of the Antarctic meant waiting for the ship to leave at the end of the expedition or maybe partway through the expedition. So, so I find it very difficult to actually imagine what, the, what it was like coping with the lack of communication. If a man sets foot there, he is over 600 miles from the nearest land. Some five and a half million square miles in size, it contains over 90% of the world's ice. Should the ice ever melt, sea levels would rise by 200 feet. Temperatures drop to almost unimaginably low levels, the lowest on record being minus 126 degrees Fahrenheit. The coldest it got down to when I was there was minus 44 degrees Celsius, which felt really cold to me. I wouldn't want it wanted it to have got any colder than that, but 
It does, uh, it certainly does. That was quite a, a warm year at the station I was at. It normally can get down to below minus 50. Um, an average minus 30 degrees C. It feels the coldest when it's windy and it's say minus 20 degrees Celsius because the, the wind just cuts through. And... The atmosphere is so pure, so free from haze, that visibility can reach up to two or 300 miles. Any sense of scale, however, is completely distorted by the total lack of vegetation. You don't go to Antarctica expecting it to be easy. Uh, there certainly are dangers, but because we know that, we take extra precautions. Particular danger is crevasses. Now, crevasses are huge, um, massive holes in the ice, which are often covered by a very, very thin layer of snow. Now, if the conditions, the weather conditions are the visibility is quite poor and there's a lot of snow blowing around, you can very easily fall into one of these crevasses. They can be anything from, from a few uh, centimetres wide to, to many tens of metres wide and they can go down to, to depths of, of many tens uh, or even many hundreds of metres in, in some, some cases. And in fact, um, one of the Scott team fell into uh, a crevasse on two occasions and that's what eventually he died from his injuries, so that was the first member of the team to, to die, the Scott team. Like a minefield in the army, you just got to go. And if you fall in, you hope that the rope which is tied between you and your sledge will su be sufficient for you to fall into the hole, but the sledge not to fall after you. Or if the sledge falls into the hole, for you not to be dragged after it. Now, very often, people would find that the man and the sledge and the dogs would all fall into the same hole and that would not only kill the man and the dogs but would often, as in the case of uh, Douglas Mawson back in 1914, um, all the food was on that sledge and they were 300 miles away from anywhere in awful country. Theirs was the slow death of starvation. So whenever we go walking in a, an unknown sort of area or unknown crevassed area, we always ha have a harness with a rope attached and we tie ourselves together with somebody who walks 10 metres in front of us, um, who's also on the other end of that rope. The idea being if, if the person in front goes down the crevasse, they'll, they'll pull me to the ground and I should have an ice axe so I can ram the ice axe in and hopefully stop them from falling too far down the crevasse. You very rarely find one that's deeper than 180 feet. But uh, you can die quite easily if you fall 180 feet because there's very sharp bits of ice all the way down that you can get stuck on and uh, smash your skull or your, your backbone. Um, it's very easy then and now to kill yourself by falling into a crevasse. It is impossible then and now to know where the crevasses are before you've fallen into them. The Antarctic can also be unbelievably beautiful, with refracted light causing full suns and moons. It was this unknown world of beauty and danger that Sir Clement Markham hoped to claim for Britain. Expeditions had ventured into the hazardous region before, from Britain, Norway and Belgium. In 1897, the Belgian ship Belgica became trapped in the Antarctic's unyielding ice field for some two years. Aboard was a young Norwegian first mate who would later play a more notable role in Antarctic exploration. Roald Amundsen. Ed Roald Amundsen had been to the Antarctic uh, before Captain Scott. He was aboard the Belgica, the first ship to winter in the south. Subsequently, he made an amazing journey through the Northwest Passage, and did that successfully, the first vessel to transit it. And he was extremely keen on polar exploration. He'd done Arctic and Antarctic, and had very much the object of reaching the South Pole. The way this expedition was organized and arranged was most strange, though. Publicly, right until the last moments, it was uh, put out as a North Polar expedition. It wasn't until he reached Madeira that he publicly announced that he was going to the South Pole. By 1899, after years of hard work, Markham had managed to raise enough money to get the British project underway. Scott was acutely aware of his own lack of experience in polar conditions, and so arranged a visit to Oslo to speak to a man whose knowledge of the area was second to none, Fridtjof Nansen, the famous explorer who had developed an unrivaled expertise in dog sledging. Take dogs to the pole, Nansen told Scott. Train them well, and they'll not let you down. <laughs> 
The method of transport that uh, had been recommended to Scott and had been used extensively in the Antarctic was sledge dogs. Uh, Nansen proposed that should be the transport they'd rely on greatly. Scott uh, had a large number of sledge dogs in the first expedition, and indeed they were breeding. Uh, second expedition, likewise, he was equipped with dogs. But he did not make the best use of them by any means. The problem with that is with an expedition that's largely naval, the experience with dogs is, is not strong in those circumstances. And one really needs two things. The dogs have to be properly trained to work with the men, and the men must know and understand the dogs for it to be effective. When neither of these is fully accomplished, then uh, their use is far less effective than it can be in proper experience dog hands. Someone who knows well to handle them, a good example is Amundsen, of course. Scott returned home with much on his mind, for whilst in Oslo, he learned of plans in other countries for expeditions to the Pole. Scott returned to Britain, determined to speed the British effort along. Firstly, a ship strong enough to force a way through Antarctic ice was needed. The tender chosen came from the Dundee Shipbuilders Company, who had a vast experience of building whaling ships, which could withstand the harsh Arctic regions. The ship needed to be made of wood to avoid hindering magnetic observations, which were essential to the expedition. First and foremost, the trip was to be a scientific survey, but the issues were already being muddled by some. The discovery was launched on the 21st of March, 1901, and Scott's expedition plans were nearly complete. Now a crew was needed. Gradually, a scientific team was assembled, all personally chosen by Scott, who had listened carefully to the recommendations and advice of fellow officers. His first recruit was, of course, Dr. Edward Wilson, who was not only a fine painter, but also a zoologist. Wilson was a valued friend and important ally over the next few years. Another significant recruitment in Scott's story was Discovery's third mate, Ernest Shackleton, a gregarious, easygoing charmer with the aura of a rebel about him. Given Scott's serious nature, the two men were poles apart and later on became rivals. I think in, in any expedition like theirs, you need a, a reasonable mix of characters. Um, I think Scott was very much the leader, and people like Shackleton, who perhaps wasn't the organisational leader, but was certainly very much the link between some of the, the people in the sort of lower ranks, if you like. I mean, it was still very much along military lines, um, obviously because of the sort of nature of these expeditions at that time. But I think that Shackleton was a one of the chaps and could get on with everybody in the expedition, whereas Scott was very much the leader and, and he felt that he had to make all the difficult decisions. Um, subsequently, of course, Shackleton went back to the Antarctic and led his own expeditions and very successfully and uh, never lost a man in, in an expedition himself. On August the 6th, 1901, Discovery set sail from the Isle of Wight towards the Antarctic. Sir Clement Markham later wrote, no finer set of men left these shores nor were men ever led by a finer captain. Discovery journeyed south to New Zealand, where she took new supplies on board and received her last overhaul before sailing on into the unknown Antarctic regions. In November, the vessel passed through the 60th parallel and amid great excitement, the crew got their first sight of ice. On January 9th, the Discovery finally landed on the continent of Antarctica. Ferocious 100 mile an hour winds battered the ship and jagged icebergs raced by her sides. We are here to fight the elements with their weapons, wrote Scott. And once and for all, this has taught me not to undervalue the enemy. In February, after a lengthy journey along the Great Ice Barrier, the Discovery crew arrived in McMurdo Sound to begin work on a hut for winter quarters. The construction work took longer than anticipated, but then a more pressing problem became apparent. The dog teams were becoming uncontrollable. As the dogs snarled, Nansen's advice must have rung in Scott's ears. Scott knew 
that dogs were a possibility. He knew that uh, tracked vehicles, it was he that took the very first motor uh, machine down in Antarctica. He was perfectly prepared to be flexible. It was Shackleton who a few years later took the first tracked vehicle ever, the, the predecessor of the Skidoo. In the field, work, when, we're, when we're out collecting the data, um, most of the travel is by, by skidoos, they're sort of small motorised snowmobiles, uh, just towing sledges, and they're, uh, they're small enough to be able to get around to, to a, a, lot of, a lot of, uh, lot of areas that might be inaccessible to larger vehicles. Um, we've got sledges for carrying all the equipment. It would have been nice to have the dogs there, but um, they were taken out in 1994, I believe. Um, we use skidoos now instead to travel about. Um, which are perhaps, well, they're quite reliable, but they certainly haven't got the character. Amundsen was perfectly stuck with dogs. He came from a country where dogs were used all the time. They certainly weren't in Britain. And so he knew that there was a strong possibility. Likewise, the Norwegian ski, the Brits don't ski. So they were using something which was familiar to them. The Navy were using a whole lot of things, none of which were familiar to them, other than the British tradition of hauling your own weights. The confidence of the party was also shaken by an incident at Cape Crozier when an exploration team got caught in blizzards. In the resulting chaos, one man was lost to the icy sea. Incredibly, every other man made it back to the ship, but it was a grave reminder of the dangers surrounding them. When there's daylight, all you can see is white. Um, it's snowing, the wind's picking up the snow and just blasting it into you, and everything is white. We have hand lines between buildings um, to help you find your way around if, if you're on base. So uh, if you lose sight of one of those, you could be in trouble, but we, we hang on to those so we, we have an idea of where we're going. The most ever-present hazard for polar explorers was frostbite. This devastating condition caused slow blackening of the extremities, and the only remedy was amputation. Frostbite, again, is a, is a very real risk. Um, but again, these days, um, we've got fairly good clothing, so you should be able to avoid getting frostbite or, other, or other, any other sort of cold injuries. Again, I think, uh, I think we have a, a slightly uh, more modern attitude these days to, to combating the cold and working in the cold, uh, in that if you, if you feel yourself getting cold, rather than pushing on the way that people might have done in Scott's days in the heroic age, uh, you'll, you know, sensible people, you'll, you'll stop and you'll warm your hands up if it was your hands that are getting cold, or warm your feet up, or just get in some shelter if you feel yourself getting cold. During the long winter months, Scott prepared for the spring journey to the South Pole. He decided on a team of three men, which included himself, Wilson and Shackleton. It was typical of Scott to recognise Shackleton's qualities and appreciate how useful they would be on the difficult march south. Any personal feelings were buried for the sake of the cause. And it was Wilson who suggested to Scott, once they were in the Antarctic, that Shackleton should join Scott and himself on a f the first attempt to uh, sledge towards the South Pole. On November the 15th, the last of the support groups turned back towards base, leaving Scott, Wilson and Shackleton with the dogs to journey forward towards the pole. Although the three men made Herculean efforts, progress averaged only four miles per day, and before long, the dogs began to weaken and die. The Enterprise took on a shambolic appearance with Scott, Shackleton and Wilson yelling frantically and the dogs pulling sporadically in different directions. By December, illness had struck. Shackleton had contracted scurvy in his mouth and Wilson was suffering from snow blindness. There's very few cases of snow blindness these days because everyone will have good sunglasses and goggles um, and um, just out of comfort, really, you tend to wear them all the time because the, the sun can be very bright, especially on sunny days when it's reflecting back from the, from the snow. It's more comfortable to wear sunglasses and that, uh, that stops snow blindness completely. I think if you are unfortunate enough to, to, to get snow blindness, uh, it's very painful at, at the time, um, but it is completely recoverable. In the long term, I don't think there's any, any long-term damage uh, done, done to the eyes.
They had reached the 82nd parallel, but Scott decided that their situation was so severe that they would have to turn back. They now faced the long and painful journey back to the ship. The dogs were dying now at the rate of one per day, and their plight broke Scott's heart. He has pulled like a Trojan throughout. His stout little heart bore him up, till his legs failed beneath him and he fell, never to rise again. By now, Shackleton was struggling for breath and spitting out blood. He had to be borne upon the sledges, and on January the 18th, he collapsed completely. Scott was typically sympathetic to his situation. He is very plucky about it, for he does not complain, although there is no doubt he is suffering badly. On the 28th of January, the party, almost spent, reached Depot A, where they had left supplies on their outward journey. With enough food, Shackleton's condition improved, and on February the 3rd, they completed their final 60-mile leg back to Discovery, to a tumultuous welcome from the crew. There was a huge celebration aboard the Discovery that night. The expedition remained in the Antarctic region for a further 18 months, conducting scientific experiments and surveys. Unexpectedly, Scott sent Shackleton home, a decision which was justified on the grounds of his poor health, although some members of the crew felt there was a degree of personal feeling involved. Shackleton, his pride hurt, stood on the deck of the relief ship as it set sail to take him home and wept. Eventually, the rest of the crew arrived back in Britain in September 1904. A shy, introverted man, Scott found the sudden demands of lectures, medal presentations and society parties difficult to cope with. I've had enough of notoriety to last me a lifetime. There's been no peace, no quiet, nothing but one mad rush, he wrote to a friend. It was with relief he returned to the Navy in August 1906, aboard HMS Victorious. Unable to escape the feeling that the job was only half done, Scott began to formulate plans to return south. By the following March, Scott was nearing the target for funding of the trip. He was also well on his way to completing the list of his new crew. Among the names were Birdie Bowers, the soldier Lawrence, Titus Oates, Atkinson, the surgeon, and Mears, who would be responsible for the dogs. From the previous expedition in 1902, were Edward Evans, Edgar Evans, and Stoker Lashley. Nansen again urged Scott to take a team of fully trained dogs. At this time, Roald Amundsen was engaged in an expedition to the North Pole, showing to what fine use dogs could be put. The Norwegian explorers, some of them had spent a lot of time working in the Arctic uh, with, with experts uh, who have been running dogs for years and years so they had a lot more experience and a lot more skills already and it could be that uh, even with the best will in the world uh, Scott and his men might not have had enough time to to learn all the skills uh, required to to run the teams and train them properly. Scott's previous bad experiences led him to decide the ponies should accompany the dogs on the journey. This has often been cited as the decision which cost Scott and his companions their lives it could be that the, the way they managed the ponies or the, the, the particular animals they had, they weren't the best animals, so it could be that, that the attempt was doomed from the start in terms of the support that the animals could give them. Um, but uh, I think the dogs in particular um, proved very useful at the time, um, but they, uh, there weren't enough of them and they weren't deployed in such a way to, uh, to really contribute to the, the, the success uh, of, the, of the trip and, and it eventually ended up in failure. Subsequent events were to prove well-trained and expertly handled dogs would certainly take a team to the pole and return them safely. Although he had originally intended to repurchase the Discovery to make their long voyage, Scott eventually decided upon the Terra Nova. Fortunately, the Discovery underwent a refit and is now preserved in all her glory at Discovery Point in Dundee.
affording a glimpse of the conditions the men journeyed to the Antarctic in. The Terra Nova set sail on June the 1st, 1910, without Scott, who was still raising money and would join the ship at Cape Town. In October, the Terra Nova arrived in Melbourne, where the grimmest news awaited Scott. It had transpired that the Norwegian, Amundsen, who had been heading for the North Pole, had been beaten there by Robert Perry and had been forced to revise his plans. Amundsen's cable to Scott was short and to the point. Amundsen thought the North Pole had been reached. If Cook and Perry had been more truthful about where they got, then it's very probable that Amundsen would have gone for the North Pole as originally planned. In those circumstances, Scott would have still continued to the South Pole. So sitting here in an armchair, one could then suggest Amundsen might have got the North quite definitely, and Scott might have survived the South. But would either of them been quite so famous as uh, now the circumstances with the competition for the South Pole? It was on November the 29th that the Terra Nova eventually set sail for the Antarctic. But not before Scott told waiting newsmen, we may get through, we may not, we may lose our lives, we may be wiped out. It is all a matter of providence and luck. These words may seem melodramatic now, but to Scott, they were merely an honest reflection of his feelings towards the task ahead. The journey towards Antarctica was particularly rough with the animals, 19 ponies and 34 dogs, bearing the brunt of the angry seas. Evans recorded that the dogs were almost hanging by their chains, whilst Oates, in charge of the poor ponies, worked like a Trojan to protect them as the ship rolled and lurched. In January, the ship arrived at Cape Evans on McMurdo Sound and the Hut Point. Dispirited to find the old hut in an extremely poor state of repair, they had nonetheless soon established excellent new quarters from which to begin their work. The next step was to establish a forward depot known as One Ton Depot, which Scott hoped to build on latitude 80 degrees south. In the event, appalling weather truncated their march, and the depot was built 20 miles to the north of the intended spot. These were, as we shall see, to be 20 crucial miles. On February the 4th, the Terra Nova, on its journey from the east, sailed into the Bay of Wales to be confronted by the sight of a ship moored there. It did not take them long to discover it was the Fram, Amundsen's ship. One astonished crewman later wrote, they had 120 dogs and are going to the pole. No science, no nothing, just the pole. Although he conceded that the Norwegians seemed charming men, even the perfidious Amundsen. They have unlimited dogs and experience in snow traveling that could be beaten by no collection of men in the world. I think that the two parties will reach the pole next year, but God only knows which will get there first. Amundsen's the science done was fairly minimal. Meteorology was recorded, but the mapping and survey was nowhere near to the same extent. In a way, with the two expeditions going to the pole, it's frequently called a race, but there's more to it than that. Scott's expedition was mapping and exploring side valleys and glaciers all the way. You couldn't exactly say it was on full speed. Amundsen's maps and the cairns and notes he left were perfectly adequate to get back safely, but not very much else. In one or two places, the actual route he took to reach the pole is uncertain, whereas Scott, we have maps carefully laid down all the way. There was quite a different character between the two South Pole journeys. After the long, sunless Antarctic winter, it was decided to begin the march to the South Pole on November the 1st, 1911. The men would split into two groups, the advance and main parties. The parties marched 15 miles apart, the advance party making the route as it progressed. Every 65 miles, depots were established for the journey back. The following main party was led by Scott and contained the majority of the dogs and ponies. Unbeknown to Scott, Amundsen and his party were already five degrees further southward, which meant that in the race to the South Pole, he had established an unassailable lead. Scott's men marched on, 
but by the end of November, the weather had worsened, forcing them to camp. It was December the 8th before any further progress was made, but after initial hopeful signs that the weather had broken, the snow and wind descended upon them once more. I would have thought that the only um, two forecasting tools they could have had would be the people standing on the ground at that time and looking up at the sky and looking at the weather. The only advance warning they would have had uh, of, of, of a storm arriving would be, would be as, it, as it came in and maybe um, the clouds came over and the wind picked up and it started snowing. Scott was now faced with another terrible problem. The ponies were completely and utterly spent. They floundered and struggled pitifully, snow up to their bellies, until the only way to move them was to beat them. Scott mercifully had them all shot, ending their misery. But because they were slaughtered many miles short of the objective, all sledge hauling from then had to be done by manpower alone. Now, a lot of people thought that, in fact, human power was more effective and better designed than dog power or even machine power. But it wasn't until 1993 that we finally proved that Scott was correct, because we have managed to cross the entire continent, not just halfway to the pole, using nothing, no outside help whatsoever, hauling all our own equipment. Many American and Soviet expeditions have tried to cross the whole continent using either dogs or machines, whatever sorts of machines, but neither the dog nor the machine has proved sufficiently fuel efficient to be able to do so without resupply at some point. Humans can. There was a great basis of correctness in Scott's thoughts when comparing dogs with people. The bad weather lasted until the 17th of December, when there was a relative improvement enabling the party to make much better progress. In late December, the time came for Scott to decide upon the summit party, the one sledge team which would actually go to the pole, and the final assault party, the men who would travel to within one short step before turning back. The remaining men returned to Cape Evans immediately. The final assault party would be Edward Evans, Crean and Lashley. This left the summit party, consisting of Scott, Wilson, Evans, Bowers and Oates. The eight men who remained ensured that Christmas Day was celebrated with a good meal. They feasted on slices of horse meat, onion and curry powder, followed by plum pudding. But the journey was beginning to take its toll. Scott noted sledging difficulties and Wilson was beset with his old problem of snow blindness. However, New Year's Eve arrived with only 170 miles to travel and food in plenty. The party was suddenly awash with optimism. It was on January the 4th that the time came for the final assault party to turn north, leaving the remaining five men to attack the pole. Crean wept openly and Lashley was so overcome he was unable to speak. The next few days march were the hardest they had known but determination and the knowledge that every exhausting step brought the pole a little nearer kept them going. On January the 10th, Scott wrote in his diary, only 85 miles from the pole, but it's going to be a stiff pull both ways, apparently. I never had such pulling. All the time, the sledge rasps and creaks. We have covered six miles, but at a fearful cost to ourselves. Still, it is wonderful to think that two long marches would land us at the pole. By Tuesday the 16th, his entry told a different tale. About the second hour of the march, Bower's sharp eyes detected what he thought was a cairn. He was uneasy about it, but argued that it must be a sastrugi. We marched on and found that it was a black flag attached to a sledge carry. Nearby was the remains of a camp. This told the whole story. The Norwegians have forestalled us and are the first to the pole. The disappointment which was felt by Scott and his men must have been overwhelming. 13 years of planning, of striving to be the first man to set foot at the pole was over. The Norwegians had arrived at the pole only one month earlier, December the 14th, 1911. Scott and his devastated party 
discovered their tent, containing the names of the five men in the party, with a letter to King Hakon. The contrast in fortune between the Norwegian party and Scott's own was stark. Their journey, which had been completed in 99 days, was made in fine weather, allowing average progress of nearly 20 miles a day. The dogs, so well-bred and trained, had performed wonderfully and food was plentiful. Apparently the dogs even gained weight. There is no doubt that the Norwegian effort had been brilliantly planned and professionally executed. Scott's expedition arrived 33 days after the Norwegians had left. They found the flag, they found the, uh, the tent, and all of these materials remaining there. The two expeditions did the same calculations of positions and backed each other up perfectly. There's no doubt about the South Pole. There was a letter left by Amundsen addressed to the King of Norway, and the object of that was if he failed to return, then the next person there would deliver the letter and the proof would be forthcoming. And that was a wise precaution. Beaten to the pole, the Polar Party now faced the dreadful prospect of an 800-mile march back to Cape Evans, cold and very weary. Scott noted the condition of the men was deteriorating, particularly Evans, who had suffered several minor injuries and had weakened badly. Today has been the worst day we have had on the trip. I have never seen such a mess of ice. I have no idea where we are or how far to the next depot. I have ordered a, a reduction in rations. We must get there tomorrow. Evans's condition was now critical, and it was obvious to the rest of the party that their companion was slowly dying. On the 17th of February, he fell into a coma, and at around midnight became the first to die on the long polar march. On February the 18th, the rest of the summit party reached the camp at the foot of the glacier where the ponies had been slaughtered. Their first full meal in a month consisted of horse meat. Food shortages were made worse by a new threat, the shortage of oil. The temperatures plummeted to minus 40 degrees centigrade, freezing their stores of paraffin. Many of the early Antarctic explorers died of exposure, certainly one of the factors that finished Scott and his team members off was the cold, was the, the lack of adequate clothing. They had a lot of natural fibres that when they sweated, that, that actually froze to their body. We know that their, their diet was a lot poorer uh, in the days of Scott's expeditions. And I think there'll be a long-term degeneration, um, probably mentally and physically, that will, that will uh, affect your judgement uh, in all the things you're doing as well. One of the uh, contributing factors to the tragic end of those returning from the pole was the weather. They were uh, going across the um, ice barrier after the equinox. It was getting progressively colder. There's two things to think about. One, the temperature it was approaching minus 40. And two, the wind, an intense wind, a blizzard in that temperature is a very powerful combination. You lose heat rapidly. Frostbite can be a severe problem. Indeed, in the case of Oates, his uh, limbs remained frostbitten uh, until he left the uh, tent. In fact, all four men were now suffering terribly with the side effects of the cold. On their arrival at the depot at Mount Hooper on March the 9th, Scott had hoped to find Cherry Garrard with the dogs, which would have undoubtedly saved their lives. But bad weather had beaten the team back to one ton depot, 72 long miles away. At this point, Scott ordered that each man should be given the means to end their suffering, and Wilson dutifully handed every man 30 opium tablets each. It was now that Titus Oates made his famous selfless sacrifice. He had begged to be left in his tent to die, but the others had steadfastly refused. Another blizzard raged, and as the wind ripped savagely at their tiny tent, Oates raised himself painfully to his frost-bitten feet. I'm just going outside, and maybe some time. With these words, the brave soldier staggered from the tent, never to be seen again. All hope had now disappeared. The three men had no oil, barely two days' food, and the appalling blizzard had not abated. Scott himself now had a badly frostbitten right foot, 
which he knew, even if by some miracle they did make it to one ton depot, would have to be amputated. Wilson and Bowers were very near to death. Wilson's moving last letter was to his beloved parents. Look forward earnestly to the day when we shall all be together in the hereafter. It is according to God's will and all for the best. I have had a very happy life. And I look forward to a very happy life in the hereafter. On March the 29th, 1912, Robert Falcon Scott made what he thought would be his last entry in his diary. It speaks volume for the strength and sheer force of will which Scott possessed that in fact he completed no less than 12 more letters. All were in a legible hand, all were clear-minded and coherent. He wrote to the mothers of Oates and Bowers and to Wilson's wife, to naval colleagues, and of course to his much-loved wife, Kathleen. But it is his remarkable message to the public which perhaps encapsulates Scott as a man. For my own sake, I do not regret this journey which has shown that Englishmen can endure hardships, help one another, and meet death with as great a fortitude as ever in the past. We took risks, we knew we took them. Things have come out against us, and therefore we have no cause for complaint. But how to the will of Providence, determined still to do our best to the last. The dead men were found on 12th of November, 1912. It was the surgeon, Atkinson, who was first to the tent, now virtually buried in the deep white snow. Petty Officer Williamson, one of the search party, wrote later. Commander Scott's face was very pinched and his hands, I should say, had been terribly frostbitten. Never again in my life do I want to behold the sights we have just seen. The sad party built a cairn over the remains of Robert Scott and his men and sang Onward Christian Soldiers, Scott's favorite hymn. A little later, an inscription was carved on a cross high on the hill overlooking Hut Point at Cape Evans. For Robert Falcon Scott, it was surely the perfect epitaph. To strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. I think he has received a bad press to some extent. He was, he's still viewed very much as the person who failed to get to the pole first, rather than someone who was a pioneer in Antarctic science. Um, and for that, I think it's rather unfortunate, really. They. Uh made a, a pre preliminary first step um, along the, the direction of the research we do today, uh, if only for the, for the, the basic mapping that they did. Um, the, the mapping of the continent is a, is a fairly basic part of, of, of any research. You know, they began that process that's carried on uh, to this day. Well, if it wasn't for Scott's expedition to the Antarctic, then people like me wouldn't have the opportunity to be working as an atmospheric chemist in Antarctica today. You know, Scott opened a door to the world's most natural environment that we have.